Hey everybody, welcome uh, to McDowell Farm School. Uh, I know you guys got to talk to Farmer Aubrey yesterday about some of our chickens, and today uh, I'm gonna come in and introduce you guys to another area at our farm we call the Sixer. So I'm Scotty, uh, I'm the Farm School Director, and what we're doing with our step out here today is kind of a description of, of McDowell's Farm School's, I guess, philosophy maybe, but also, you know, why we do what we do in this certain space. There's a lot of really cool things happening out here that I think, you know, you may be implementing your house, even in a small raised bed. Some of the stuff we do out here on a large scale are things that you can do in your backyard, um, even with the kind of the varieties of stuff we're going to be talking about. So hopefully you guys can get some, uh, some knowledge out of this and take it to your house and grow some, grow some food at home. And if you guys have any questions throughout, or if you think of anything, just go ahead and send them in to us and we'll do a separate video where we can come in and, and answer those questions for you, at least try to. You know, we don't know everything, but we'll, we'll do our best with it. So first off, um, like I said, this is called the Sixer. And the reason we call this the Sixer is because there are six areas that we grow in. We call those areas blocks. So within each one of our blocks, we have what are called beds. And these are all what we call raised beds. So you have, in this block, we just have, looks like four right here right now. So we have four beds in this block. And within each one of these beds, we take it down smaller to what we call rows. So when we go through here, and I'm going to start picking out one of these carrots here in a second, you're going to see that we planted these carrots in three rows. And that's just to maximize the amount of yield that you get from a raised bed. Do the same kind of thing in your backyard, just thinking about how much space each one of your, your plants needs. So crops like carrots don't need as much room. You can plant them really close together. So um, Josh is going to come in here, and we're going to, um, I'm going to talk about these carrots that we have. Now the, the, the greens on these carrots aren't huge, uh, but these carrots were actually put in the ground uh, in early November of last year. And we picked a certain variety of carrot um, because of their storage potential. So what that means is that you can, take a, you can take a certain type of carrots, start them up, and they'll get to almost this point growth-wise. And then over winter, as you know, these Alabama temperatures cool down a little bit, these carrots will actually store, store in the ground. So they won't lose any of their taste, uh, and, but they won't grow either. So what they'll do is they'll be in the ground for a long period of time. And in this case, they've been in the ground for almost five months, six months, five months. There we go. And what you can do is at that point when they're ready to harvest, you can just pull them up and go. So all of these carrots right now are actually ready to get out of the ground. Um, the variety that we have planted here are Bolero, and specifically they are storage carrots. So people grow them for their ability to store. Uh, I'm gonna see if I got a good one over here. We've been kind of picking them and if you see the holes in the ground right here It's where we've kind of been harvesting selectively So we've been kind of been thinning out giving the other carrots a little bit of room to grow and get bigger So carrot harvesting is one of the best things in the world if you aren't growing carrots at your house It's super easy, but it's also amazing and it's really rewarding to pull a carrot up out of the ground So hopefully I won't break it if I do it's okay. You can still eat it so typically what I do is like work the soil around it really loose with my fingers. Um, if you're doing a large harvest of carrots, a broad fork's the best tool to use because you can just go under, lift the soil up, and just pop those carrots right out. But just for today, I'm just going to pull one out by hand and probably three. Maybe I can pick one out here. So then we have a carrot. And this carrot is really old, but it will still taste delicious. It's pretty muddy right now, so let me wipe it off. But this is a lot of what we're eating these days out here. Um, we're pretty much having carrots with every meal right now because we got a lot of them. And I know some of our kids that came out for farm school already this year did a lot with carrots as well. We had those at lunch many times. So this is, this is that storage carrot variety. And it's almost time to get it out. What will happen is if it starts warming up, your carrots will actually seed. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll produce a flower. And then that's when they get into that reproductive phase of a carrot. So if you're wondering where carrot seeds come from, it actually comes from carrot flowers. All right, so we're gonna move on and look through here. Um, on our right side right here, we have some onions. These are also over overwintered. Almost anything that's gonna grow underground, whether it's a root or a bulb, is something that you can store. So in this case, we're dealing with um, some onions. And then on the other side, the next bed over, are more onions. Um, and then to the right of those, if you're, if you're looking where you can tell the direction right now, we have some garlic growing. And that garlic will be ready in a couple months. Um, and those are another bulbous plant at the bottom. So the stuff that's growing underground is usually stuff that you can leave in over winter. We're going to head back over here. I'm going to show you some other stuff we got in the ground. All of this stuff here, 
that you're looking at was put in the ground in November of last year. So it's stuff that we've overwintered. All right, then when you come up here, some onions. These onions were put in the ground a couple of weeks ago, so these will be onions that are ready this summer. Um, and they're short day onions, so they'll be ready to go. And I think most of them are candy. Some of them are a red candy and some of them are a yellow. In our beds over here behind those onion beds, these are potatoes. So these are all potatoes. And the reason you're not seeing anything is because that potato starts off way underground. Now we're going to come over here because I see some pretty awesome stuff happening. And I see some potato starts where they've shot up all the way underground and now they're starting to come out at the top. So this is actually a potato right here. So these are two potato starts here. So what we'll do with these is eventually we'll probably end up having to hill them. So that just means we'll take um, soil from the side of this bed and throw it on top. You can even bury all the greens of the potato and they'll keep bursting through and continue to go up. And then you can harvest from the bottom up. You get a lot of potatoes out of it that way. I think a lot of these are Yukon Golds. All right, next out here. See, we've been in one of our blocks up there. This is the second block. And now we're gonna look at this third block. So this looks like a tarp. You may throw some laundry detergent, some dishwashing detergent on it, put it on a hill and slide down it. You probably could do that here. Uh, we're using it for a different purpose. Most people think of tarp as keeping rain off and this tarp will do that. Um, but if you look under here, we're gonna pull up underneath it. Notice that we have this clover here that's green. This is also clover. And we're gonna talk about why we have clover here in a second when we get into cover cropping over there. And the decomposition of this clover is sped up. And that's because this silage tarp traps all of the heat under here. So that, that decomposition process really, really starts going. Um, no light is getting to these plants. You can see how they're losing their color. So they're not able to photosynthesize. You get all kinds of critters under here, critters that aren't all about the light. Um, I think this is an, actually a tick. I don't know how that got in there. That's pretty interesting though. Um, ants are never a bad thing here. So this will be ready to turn into whatever our next crop's gonna be. So we'll work this soil next um, and then we'll be able to put whatever's gonna go in here. I think it's watermelon. So this whole area, when we pull this silage tarp back, um, a lot of this green here will be broken down and it'll create green manure for our soil. So it helps build that soil up. Below that is also some clover. And this clover below here is kind of interesting. It was planted at the same time as the clover behind us, right over here. So that clover was planted at the same time. Now a good question here is why is that clover right there that much taller than this clover over here? And the answer is, is that we're in Nauvoo, Alabama, surrounded by Bankhead National Forest, and there are a ridiculous amount of deer. So deer are actually one of our biggest pests here at McDowell Farm School. Um, the section that you're in right, that we're in right now, wasn't fenced off before. So the deer actually grazed it down really, really hard at the beginning, right when it started shooting up. So it, it didn't get the chance to grow as much as this over here. The fence that we see around us uh, was actually closed in behind us. So all of that section behind us that's green and vibrant, all of that was actually fenced in. We can walk over here and talk about this fence real quick and why we use the type of fencing that we do use um, and how it's been pretty pretty effective for us. I think two days ago we actually extended this fence around so now we put this new stuff in here hopefully we'll keep those deer out. All right let's walk over here to the fence we'll talk about that real quick. This is particularly in place for our deer. Now you're not going to keep deer out of, a, out of a field unless you have probably a permanent eight foot fence up because deer are excellent jumpers and they can jump at least seven foot high. What we have installed here is a 3D fence. Now this 3D fence looks like a 3D fence. I guess the 3D, come, the third dimension comes with it separate. So if you're looking at it straight on here, it looks 2D. But as you get closer to that fence, then it adds that, that third dimension. So on the outside of this, you see that this is an electrified wire. So as those deer come in, and they're cautious, so the deer are creeping in, the first thing that they'll touch would be the electric, electric, electric wire. That word's killing me today, guys. I don't know why. But the deer will touch that with their nose, and if they do, it'll hit them and it'll scare them and they'll run off. Um, if they try to jump that, they may be tangled in here, so it may be they, they can't tell the distance. That's also a deterrent. 
Um, but the electric fence is the main thing keeping them back. So hopefully they come in, they touch that, and then it scares them off and they run. Um, anything bright, flapping, those are things that also freak deer out. I mean, they're, they're only seeing in black and white, but any type of movement on a fence, that stuff helps as well to keep them out. You mostly just want to spook them, and that'll keep them away. Um, but we have, like I said, a really massive deer problem here at Camp McDowell, which may not be a deer problem, but it's just one of, some of our neighbors that we have to deal with. Um, and they really like the stuff that we're growing. So the things that we're growing in our, in our patch of field right here are things that deer really, really love to eat. So we're going to talk about um, cover cropping that we do here at Camp McDowell. So one of the big themes of what we do here at the farm school is regenerative agriculture. So ideally, we're not taking anything um, from another system and bringing it in here, specifically things like um, nitrogen and phosphorus. So what we're doing is letting those things be created by the plants themselves. So anytime we come in here and we, and we grow a crop, whether it's corn or whether it's peas or anything like that, what they're doing is um, those things are taking nutrients from the soil because they have to use those nutrients to create their body and then create the fruit that they provide for us to eat. So what that does is it leaves soil a little bit depleted. So if we're continuously putting the same plants back into the ground um, and not giving anything to our soil, then eventually that soil would be depleted and those plants won't be successful. So in order for us to do this naturally, what we've done is we've incorporated cover cropping. And this happens all over uh, the farm school at Camp McDowell. We're going to talk about the, the, the things that we actually have in this field right now. And this is a mixture. So we're going to come a little bit closer and I'm going to talk about what we have here. Um, one of the first things you see, and you'll see this all over the ground right now specifically in spring are clover now clover what we call legumes and a lot of people know what those are but what they are is they're nitrogen fixing plants so what what's going on within these plants is pretty amazing um the nitrogen that's in the air all around us and it's the most abundant gas in our atmosphere is not in the form that we can use it's something that we need but it's not something that's in a usable form and something that we can access so what happens with crops like legumes is they have a symbiotic relationship with a soil dwelling bacteria and this is pretty neat because this bacteria can actually fix that nitrogen out of the air and takes that nitrogen and it lives on the roots of plants like these this clover and different types of peas and it transfers that nitrogen into that plant now it's a beneficial relationship because that bacteria is getting protection and it's getting carbohydrates and then the plants getting the nitrogen from those bacteria it's pretty amazing and it's good for us because we're able to plant a crop that will put nitrogen back into the soil for us because instead of ripping this out of the ground what we'll do is we'll go in here and chop it into tiny pieces with a flail mower and then we'll reincorporate it back into our soil so all that nitrogen that was created gets to be replenished back into the soil and we can use it to grow plants here which is pretty it's a pretty neat process and it very it, it doesn't damage your soil so it's it's a very healthy way of doing it so I'm going to try to dig one up and show, show you guys some of the nodules that are growing. And those nodules is, that, is what's being grown by that bacteria. It's where that nitrogen is being stored. Hopefully this works. Um, if you notice, this clover is flowering. And you're going to start seeing these everywhere right now. Um, this is crimson clover. And you can kind of tell that by the, the type of flower that's popping out right now. So we're going to dig down in the soil. Hopefully we'll see some, some of those nodules. So once that plant's flowered, usually um, if I got if I didn't rip off all the root system of this plant, which I may have, we may have to go go again, um, try another one. By the time that flower that uh, clover is flowered, then those nodules are usually fully formed. Um, sometimes they'll have a light pink coloring to them. Uh, and that light pink coloring is just the nitrogen nodule being full. Uh, I'm going to keep going because we're going to find one in all of this somehow. We will pull one up and show you guys this process because it's really amazing. And they're here. And if we don't find any, we're just going to cut this out <laughs> and plant some for you guys to see it. But no, they're, they're going to be here. I found some right here. Um, so I'm going to separate these this root system a little bit. And you can see this is a fully developed clover plant with a crop. So you see the flowers at the top of that. And then at the bottom of it, you're going to see... And I'm going to put it on my hand so you guys can see it. You're going to see these tiny little nodules. Um, there's one right here that hopefully you can zoom in. You'll be able to see that nodule on my hand. Is that enough light? Do you see it right there, the little bitty bump? There's one right there at the end of my thumb. See that one? And these things will be covered in these nodules. Um, 
this whole field is covered in these nodules underground and all that's just nitrogen that we can take and put back into our soil and there's some here and then all throughout these plants root systems you'll see those little nodules it's not the best example i've ever seen but there are some happening um, so other things that we have going here besides clover we have another leguminous plant it's an austrian snow pea and there's one right here and as you can see this snow pea is actually climbing up this ryegrass which is pretty neat um, but the snow pea is another legume so it's also one of those nitrogen producing plants or it's fixing nitrogen for us with that relationship with the bacteria um, they're also pretty tasty if you want to eat those uh, like I said, I have the ryegrass here, um, and what the, the ryegrass is doing is the ryegrass is keeping that nitrogen that's being created, or the nitrogen that's already in the soil, from leaching. So when it rains, um, and if you don't have your soil covered, that rain can wash off and it'll take nitrogen and soil with it. What this does is helps keep that soil together, but it also leaches up some of that nitrogen into the soil. And what we'll do with it is we're going to tear this down and put it back into the soil so we're not losing that nitrogen. And like I said, it could be washed off in, in storms. Um, and in this case, we're keeping it here. Another thing that's growing here are daikon radishes. And they're kind of aerating our soil. So they dig deep with that taproot and they break our soil open and it creates space. Um, so you get aeration from that too. And it's kind of like a natural tiller. Um, and they're also delicious, so you can eat them as well. Some of these are fully developed. But you can chop this up, stir fry, it, put it in a slaw. I've been throwing them on um, quesadillas, doing all kinds of stuff with them. They're pretty tasty. But they're also breaking that soil up down there. And then the last thing we have down here is a hairy vetch as well. And it's hopefully in this space over here that we found some earlier. Um, where's that vetch hiding? It's in there. Another thing, if you'll notice this too, is you notice how high the different height on these plants and the different spaces that they're occupying um, they'll compete with each other big time at the very very beginning and then they start getting nitrogen and different or getting um, sunlight in different places so the ground here is completely covered keeping um, all of our stuff from eroding down the hillside right here and if you have a barren area where you're not growing anything all that stuff can just erode and you'll lose all those nutrients and all that soil you've been building up over years Farm school has been building up soil in this area in different areas around the farm for over eight years um, And it's stuff we don't want to lose we put a lot of time and effort into it So along with uh, taking this cover crop and reincorporating it back into the soil We'll also add compost to this and then when that process is complete Then we'll be able to add our new plants for the season. This is this stuff is about ready to be tilled We're waiting or um, flailed and we're waiting for the all this sunshine to kind of dry the soil up a little bit for us Before we start going in there and breaking it up um, that's an introduction to cover cropping. There's a lot more that I could talk about and a lot more that you can research online. So if you're at home um, and you're looking for ways to, to kind of build some knowledge on some interesting stuff, you can use cover crop in your raised bed at home as well. Um, and you're not going to have to add any fertilizer from the store. And that way you're creating a natural system that you can use it at home. So planting clover, um, these are things that you can plant in the late fall and it'll overwinter, just like our carrots up there. And then when it comes springtime and everything's developing flowering, then you can reincorporate it into your soil and then your soil will be ready for all those awesome spring vegetables and summer stuff with your tomatoes and your, um, and your squash and your okra. All that stuff will be ready and it needs a lot of nutrients for that kind of stuff. They suck a lot out of the ground. Um, so you got to get that stuff ready. You can do this at home. But um, and this is a great time uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you have some time to do some research to so look up George Washington Carver. Um, he did a just an amazing job of spreading what cover cropping does for your soil. Now everybody knows him as the peanut man and you guys probably do at home. That's what you're thinking with George Washington Carver and you start talking about peanut butter and all the things that he did with this. And But I want you to look up why he did that because that's where the, the, the genius of the man kind of comes out when you look up. Here's why he actually did this. Um, and you can look that up at home. Um, it's really, really interesting and he, he's, he's an interesting person and somebody that had a big lasting impact on agriculture in general. Um, somebody that I really look up to and, and thinks is super interesting. So look up George Washington Carver and you can learn a little bit more about why we're doing cover cropping here. And he was doing that a long time ago. So using, you know, older methods of farming sometimes are actually more beneficial than the stuff that we do now. Um, that's pretty much it for the sixer. I know we're going to cover some more stuff. I think Carol Ann is going to talk to people tomorrow about maybe milking, which is pretty exciting. Um, so make sure you're tuning in for that. 
And then if you have any questions about what we're doing out here, um, or if you have any corrections to where it said, hey, you said this, this wasn't correct, uh, feel free to, to reach out and, uh, and maybe we have a video where we can respond to that kind of stuff. And if you have different methods of growing that you do at home and you wanna talk about that stuff, uh, we'd love to get, get your opinions on it. Um, another thing we can talk about later on is maybe looking at some of the raised beds builds that we have and giving you some ideas for things that you can do at your house. Having food that you've grown yourself is a pretty amazing process. Um, and having kids come out to McDowell Farm School and get to experience it is something that kind of kickstarts a drive to grow your own food at home. So if you take anything from these videos, you know, it's you can do these things at your house. They don't have to be on this large scale like we have. You can do them in a really small space and get a lot of food um, for you and your family. And it's fun. So don't be afraid to try, you know, and you can get better and better and better at it. But we appreciate you guys coming in and hanging out with us today. Um, we look forward to hearing your questions and, and trying our best to answer them. So have a great day and, you know, hopefully you get a little sunshine where you are. If you can get out in it, if you can't, that's okay. Uh, maybe you will pretty soon. Have a great day.